Well, welcome everybody to the Fasting Transformation Summit, where we are uncovering the most ancient, inexpensive, and powerful healing strategy known to mankind. We're talking about fasting. I'm your host, Dr. David Jockers, and I'm excited about today's interview because we're going to really talk about women, juice fasting, intermittent fasting, and really how to customize these things, not only the benefits of them, but also really how to customize them for the female body. And so in order, in order to go through this topic, I brought on a good friend of mine, Erin Elizabeth, who is really an award-winning journalist. Um, she covers a wide range of health topics, extremely passionate health blogger and, and health freedom advocate. And uh, you know, if you're interested in knowing the inside scoop of what's going on in the health industry, definitely check out healthnutnews.com. And so Erin, thanks so much for joining us here for the Fasting Transformation Summit. Thanks, Doc. It's an honor to be here. Thank you. Great to awesome. Be here. Yeah. And so tell us your story and how you really got involved with health to begin with and, and kind of some of the struggles that you've had in the past. Sure. Since it's been one of these days here, um, I think I'll just be, like I said, I'll just be kind of blatantly forthcoming and honest, but keep it succinct as well for you. Um, yeah, I was adopted and started out with a pretty bad you know, um, I guess beginning, I guess you could say. So my, my birth mother had, um, had an abortion when she was pregnant with me with, with medical doctors and everything. And that failed. And I was able to survive that when I was born, I was very, very sick. I was hospitalized the first few months of my life. Um, and they weren't sure that I would make it. And I was on many, many drugs, antibiotics, unable to be adopted. And because of my, um, because of being so ill, but then finally they did allow me to be adopted. Um, and of course I wasn't breastfed or anything like that. And, uh, so once I, once my parents got me their first time parents, so with the new baby that they're adopting, and I still think that my mom who, um, I love and adore is uh, still with us today that she had kind of a mother's instinct, but they decided, even though it was January, just after a little bit after they got me in, um, Chicago, cold weather, I had a severe cold, plus I was just sick in general. Um, the doctor said it was fine to do all the vaccinations, including the DPT. So I went into uh, febrile seizures, was hospitalized. Um, they thought that I was not gonna make it. The priest was called, they did a um, uh, spinal tap and we were thinking spinal meningitis because God forbid that they tried to understand that it was just the vaccinations I had. Now granted, I had some other things that were set up set up there that were uh, not helping, but basically I had encephalitis. So they told, um, then said I would be brain damaged and probably institutionalized for the rest of my life. Um, so I'm not, luckily, and uh, it was kind of a miracle on day seven when the priest was there, and if I made it, that I would not be, that I would be severely brain damaged from encephalitis. Uh, they thought initially spinal meningitis, which is why they did the spinal tap, that the fever broke, the seizures did stop, although I was paralyzed on one side of my face. Still, this eye is lower, um, but I, always, I wrote a story called The Girl with a Half Crooked Smile because for months, there are many baby pictures I posted where only one side of my face moves, but I did regain the use of the um, left side of my face uh, for the most part, so that's my beginning. <laughs> wow, what, a, what an introduction to life. Yeah. And so you obviously have a survivor spirit. Uh, yes, I, I guess push so. through that. Yeah. Yeah, we we you know we kind of consider that um, a miracle. So my mom yes. and dad who who raised me, and uh, so then even though they weren't really into health, my and my aunt and uncle were very much so, and my uncle had a. Um, health freedom. Um, I don't know if there's that exact name, if it was the headquarters here in Florida of all places, although I was raised, born in Chicago and raised in the freezing cold Midwest. But um, so made it through all that. And then um, so I was, I, I think just since I was so unhealthy as a kid and uh, they, they didn't understand, you know, of course they, they didn't understand why they knew I'd had a rough start, but they just couldn't quite figure it out. Um, my uncle was a bit, he was also my godfather, was a big influence on me. Um, but even luckily, my parents were not, they, they knew that it was probably not a good idea to have sodas and real those sweet and sugared cereals. But besides that, they were not real health nuts, you know, as I like to call myself. Um, but I think then working for a nonprofit through, I mean, I went through high, got through high school and, and was working for a nonprofit group. 
um, where very much into it was more environmental uh, group and also for a, lo a lot of different things. But one of the things that they were teaching us about just by kind of by default by working there was about organic food. And uh, that was so um, awesome to be able to learn about that. And that was in the late 80s. So I was still a teenager then. Um, and I lived above a vegetarian organic restaurant. So I think those people all had and actually the it was by Orthodox. Um, they were um, uh, the Orthodox priests, they were not Greek Greek Orthodox. I don't know if it's American Orthodox, but it was very interesting. And I think those folks just being, by, again, by default, in this apartment, I was able to learn while going to school so much about organic lifestyle. Um, and uh, then shortly thereafterward, I actually met my birth mother. I forgive her, uh, love her, I've known her. I found her through a book she'd written about giving me up. And uh, so we've known each other since I was 20 years old. So that's a long time. And so she was unable to have other children after me. So I met and having then gone to Europe to meet her through my travels to Europe too, and being very sick, barely able to make the flights. And I'm only 2021, 20, but I would get so sick on these long flights. But it, while in Europe, learning more about healthy eating, more so than we were doing in the uh, than we're eating in the U.S. It's very different kind of a lifestyle there. So um, then I began. Um, when I lived in California, also was in a natural health, and for a number of years here, I taught health retreats on the East Coast of uh, Florida. We didn't really do intermittent fasting, but we did definitely discuss it at the retreats, but they were shorter, more three to four days, and uh, we, we didn't really incorporate uh, any fasting into that, but um, been doing that, and then that's through the retreats is how I met Joe, Dr. Mercola. We've been together nine years this month, so um, that just to give you kind of a, a, a little Congratulations bit. on that. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Yep, and I know we met at The Truth About Cancer, and you were there with Dr. Mercola, of course, and most of our listeners probably know him because he's got the largest natural health website, and uh, we both shared the stage, and uh, you just, you brought such uh, an impassioned, every time you've spoken, just an impassioned um, presentation on some of the politics that are going on in, you know, just the health freedom movement, and I was always inspired by the things that you shared. Oh, thank so. you. Well, I've been, before I even started my site, not to just, I've been, I was reading uh, your, your site and reading your work. So yeah, you're definitely an inspiration as well. So grateful to have you. Well, well thank, thank you. you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. And so let's, let's talk about some of the biggest mistakes nutritionally and lifestyle based that women are making on a regular basis that's affecting their health. Sure. Um, I think that especially with women more so than men, um, that we are kind of inundated with products and so many of them I, that's the first thing that comes to mind when you say that so so many of them are are not natural and yet as women i think it's it's this kind of idea that we just have a little bit different maybe how we dress how we you know grooming everything than, than men because guys for the most part aren't wearing any makeup or are not really maybe using a little bit but they don't might not use many hair products or um or so many different things, skin moisturizers and all the things that women do. So I think uh, starting there, that was one of the first things for me was um, to, to go organic with the products that I would use because inevitably we're going to be on stage like you and I shared a stage or we're going to be in front of the camera and we're gonna wanna wear a little makeup. But um, I think that it's important to find um, products that are non-toxic. So whether they're uh, phthalate free or paraben free or even if people can find totally even plant-based products now that women will have for their face, hair, skin, face, nails, all that kind of stuff that maybe men don't have to worry about as much. And then another thing I would say that, uh, would you say, did you say some of the mistakes that women would make? Yeah. 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 Um, I would say that another one for women would be that so many as, as you know, with, uh, with, for moms that they, it, 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 and even if you're not a mom, that's okay too. So, but for all women, um, I think so many times that women are natural, they're nurturers and they will be, um, they'll kind of be not, I don't want to say caretakers or caregivers, but sometimes they'll expend so much of their energy to help other people, especially their children or family members and able to uh, be there to provide for them yet. And not, and the men do that too, but sometimes the women will, I think, um, 
it just expend themselves too mm -hmm. much. And uh, so they have to take time for themselves. So often I don't think that, that women are just by nature those uh, nurturing creatures and uh, maybe that's how God intended. And so I think that they make sure they take time for themselves. And that would probably be true for men too because we are, everyone's working so hard these days. Um, and then another thing that I would add on there, um, hmm, uh, I would say too, I don't know, it could tie in with the, the first one, but I think, I don't know if it's more men than women, I haven't really uh, studied this, but I think that also there is this pressure upon women by society to um, it, to be a certain shape or size or look a certain way. It sure seems like, as I see female public figures more than male, if a guy's kind of a big guy, no one gives him a hard time. The woman, if they're too thin, too heavy, that there can be so much societal pressure put on them that so many I know that I talk with will um, develop maybe unhealthy eating habits. Not that they they may have great food in their homes, but they will. And I've been, I've had this happen in my past as well, where they will um, have kind of feel the pressure to, I know with somebody here helping me at the house today where she's on a diet and she looks great, but she feels that she, I'm not sure if it's society or the gym she works out at, then she looks great, doesn't need to lose a pound, but she's on a diet that she has to lose weight because we have to feel we have to look this certain way. And I think uh, it can develop into, um, eating disorders, uh, or what my problem was probably was, uh, or emotional eating, stress eating. And, uh, I know that men can have that too and definitely do. And I don't want to deflect from that, but I think for women, especially that they learn healthy eating habits and taking time for themselves, maybe when they're preparing the meal for the family, or just if it's them or if they live by themselves or whatever the case may be, that they take the time to slow down and eat healthy and learn really healthy eating habits. Maybe intermittent fasting can help as well, especially for those who may do emotional eating or uh, have, have some type of eating disorder, which is so many, there's not just anorexia, of course, but you could yeah. uh, just be a stress eater, for instance, which is very common, especially in women. Yeah, I'm glad that you brought that up. That is a huge topic, and a lot of people are not talking about that either. So yeah. thank you for that. And so let's talk about juice fasting. I know you're a big advocate of juice fasting. So what are the benefits of that? What kinds of things do you like to juice when, uh, when you go on kind of a juice fast detox? And how do you implement this into your lifestyle on a regular basis? Sure. Well, I started with doing three different programs, which I won't go into around different parts of the United States where they all incorporated juice fasting and they all, just because it was detox, I'm not saying, I'm sure many of the people who were going through the program were not exclusively vegan in normal life, but they were while they were doing these programs and it, they were all raw programs in three different cities around the country. And so that's where I really began to learn about the juice fasting and we would have days where we would only do juices. So um, if I'm really doing a hardcore kind of detox cleanse, I will stick more with um, just green, uh, you know, all different types of greens. There are so many, um, it, you know, may, maybe it will be uh, celery, kale, some will incorporate even a green apple, but if, if I'm doing and so many other vegetables, so I will stick with green vegetables, I should say, maybe a little cucumber, which is technically a fruit. But um, if I'm maybe uh, not being as so diligent about it, then I may incorporate some beet um, or some, even some, even some, uh, you know, fruits or do a little orange, you know, fresh squeezed orange juice and things like that. But just depending on what I'm doing. But if I'm, if it's a really hardcore uh, juice fast, and especially then I may start out doing a little, uh, like some beet and carrot juice, which would be higher, you know, would have higher levels of sugar, but then kind of wean off onto just doing the, uh, the vegetables, so to speak, or which would people probably know as green, green juices. And, um, I have a pretty good, uh, complicated, a few complicated recipes that I can always share. I'm sure they're yeah. up on the site. Um, yeah. that, that I may not know off the top of my head <laughs> because I've always been pretty open about well, juicing I can do, but my I can I can cook, but it's never been my strong suit. It's not my area of expertise. But um, if I'm in the in, in the kitchen, I'll usually if I'm doing a video, then I'd usually have help from a, a chef because by no means do I claim to be. <laughs> a big time chef, although I can, I can make meals and, and, and have throughout my life. But with the, 
with the greens, I think that um, some of the medical doctors or the NDs or DCs who I've worked with um, have, they'll do some, some of the greens will be quite complicated, even having a lot of dandelion, which is very detoxing. Mm. They don't always taste great. And then, yeah, of course, I do the, the wheatgrass as well. Now, for some people, they don't want to because the wheat in the wheatgrass, that may be a problem for some people, um, but it hasn't been for me so long as I'm doing smaller amounts and I find as I'm doing more of the juice fasting and cleansing my body over maybe that week or 10 days that by the end I can consume quite a bit more ounces of wheatgrass than say on my first day where I've I back years ago before I knew any better, I'd start and juice three, get my the cranker out and do like three or four ounces of wheatgrass and drink it and actually even thrown it up because immediately afterwards, because my body was just a little too toxic or it was too much to handle maybe three or four ounces of wheatgrass. But at the end of the seven or 10 days of juice fasting or even just fasting with um, some little bit of raw food incorporated, but lots of greens, not doing a lot of any, really any fruits um, that I, I found that, wow, yeah, I can, my body can handle substantially more wheatgrass at the end of that time, or even uh, more greens because it's, it's a, uh, it's detoxing that I'm, I'm, my body's becoming cleaner. So. Yeah. And we look at things like wheatgrass, you have so much chlorophyll and trace minerals and just all the bio photons that have been, you know, uh, absorbed and are housed inside of that grass. So when you, you kind of liberate it, cause we can't break down that, that cellulose, that fiber. So you liberate these bio photons and all these micronutrients, but through the juicer, and then you're drinking that up and it's going to obviously have tremendous impact on your cellular energy systems, your detoxification systems. And so what, what kinds of things can people expect when they start to juice things like wheatgrass or making green juices or even a carrot beet juice like you were talking about? Well, initially I think, and I've, I've seen it and, and I probably would more than when I started just because of uh, even being more busy than I was maybe when I began 10 or 15 years ago. But um, I know that some people would initially have those detox uh, reactions, so they may have a headache or be a bit lethargic and not feel great. So uh, no people are like, whoa, I don't know if that's for me, if that's how I feel. But then I think once you get past that day one, day two, same with if you were doing water fasting, mm -hmm. uh, once they'll get past those initial few days, then I think that the, um, the you're, as you're detoxifying, and I'll usually do if I'm now if I'm at one of those three places around the country that I did, I completed the program, graduated, whatever you call it, get my certification. Um, I would do incorporate um, colonics and other, or at least enemas to help further uh, detox. Because for those first few days, you do, I, I believe that you, you feel probably the worst, those couple of days as your body is um, just adapting. But I noticed that people who decide not to do, they're just, maybe they're against it for whatever reason, they're not doing the wheatgrass, I'm sorry, they're not doing any enemas, they're not doing colonics. Um, it could be difficult because you know, what goes in must come out and we really want to be able to uh, cleanse our bodies during that time. So I think what helps me so much um, it is plenty of rest, plenty of rest while you're doing that. But of course, also, I mean, there's a there are different modalities, but I would say that at least uh, enemas, if you don't want to do colonics, and that again might not, not sound fun to people, but I mean, we've done that even in a few different countries at events we've spoken at where they'll put us through their program there, and you feel so much better uh, when you're doing that uh, as opposed to uh, not doing any kind of, uh, you could always, of course, take uh, like a psyllium husk or something to help cleanse your body, but I think that those those extra um, the, the extra things like the colonics or enemas can make a big difference. And even you can even do um, after a colonic, I know it's, we're getting pretty specific here, but like a, a, then a wheatgrass implant and the energy that it can give you when you do that is pretty amazing. So. Yeah, so then you, you do the, the enema, you flush out, and then you go ahead and you add in wheatgrass rectally, right? Yeah. And so you yeah. get the, those benefits kind of passing into the, the bloodstream quicker and then also... Um, adding more oxygen and detoxifying the colon. So, oh, yeah. See, you explain. Yeah. Which I always say I'm a, a journalist, not a scientist, but <laughs> you no don't worries. explain it so much more eloquently. So, thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And so, when we're juicing, I used to always like break food into different categories. Like, you have your juice producing, like your true, like liquid producing types of things. Like, you've got cucumbers and celery and bok choy. Um, mm -hmm. if you're doing like a lower carb one, if you're doing high carb, you got carrots, beets, 
Um, then you've got your dark greens, right? So that you can mix in. So you've got um, yeah. your collard greens and kale and things like that. And you've got your bitters like parsley, ginger, cilantro. And so what sort of combinations do you like to throw together? Oh gosh. Now I'll, I'll totally admit that uh, honestly, um, if I'm, if I'm doing it, then I'll, I'll kind of get out. I've got, in fact, I'm, some of the books are under this computer that I'm using today, but, um, I will, <laughs> if I'm doing it, I, I'll sometimes just do something simple, but I guess a very simple combination that I would do. I like to do a little celery, cucumber, uh, dandelion, kale, um, and maybe a, a little bit of cilantro. I don't, I admittedly kind of like a, um, maybe not a well, an untrained chef and, or, and that's, that's just throwing their own mixes together. I will either follow a, follow a schedule or um, I'll, I'm kind of put like a whole smorgasbord, put a lot of them in together. So there's even one that a doctor out of Dallas has given us um, where we have 15 or, 20, 15 or 20 greens in that juice that we're doing. It's actually making me kind of crave it right now, um, but I could definitely get you a list and I, I should know those off the top of my head. Um, but yeah, those are, to give something easy like that, I'll, I'll do something, I'll do something like that. Also, sometimes I'll just stick with one, uh, if I'm doing more higher carbs or sugars, I'll just do, um, you know, maybe 18, 20 ounces of just carrot juice or just beet juice or a combination of the carrot and beet together. Um, and with the greens, um, it just depends on my mood or sometimes what's available. We're not in a big town here in a, in a barrier island and we don't have hope I can say the name Whole Foods or any of those. So sometimes it's just what the farmer has available, what's in season or what we're able to get our hands on because we don't have um, access like some people may be in bigger cities to all the to all the greens all the time. Although we do grow our own um, and we will be coming upon growing season again here, which makes it much easier, especially with our collard greens and other things. But in the heat of the summer, especially the heat that we had this summer, uh, we couldn't grow much during mm. that time except we do um, our sunflower uh, sprouts, just, right? sprouts, and also I, I have added those in before. Sometimes I'll just eat them, but I really like juicing them. Um, like I know they've done it. Some of the programs I've done even here in Florida where, um, yeah, juicing, I like juicing the sprouts as well because sometimes you'll kind of get yourself to consume a lot more than if you were just to eat the sprouts, which for some people they love them, but other people, maybe they aren't incorporating them into their diets or salads as much as they'd like. So the sprout juicing is also we like to do so or throw those in sometimes with the greens if that helps yeah that's really cool and sprouts are just so enzymatically active and alive right because oh yeah it's almost like stem cells coming from the plant um yes. you know and so you're just getting all this enzymatically active uh new nut high nutrient bioavailable uh food that you're putting into your system and very low calories so there's like not much cost on your digestive system yeah you're not going to produce much as far as oxidative stress, consuming them, yet you're getting all of these um, enzymes and, and active nutrients. And so it's a, it's a huge net gain, right? It's awesome. Oh, yeah. The, the live enzymes are so yeah. important. Another thing that you uh, made me think of is we use a slow juicer. I mean, it does, I don't mind whatever brand of people ask me, but I yeah. would go like a slow RPM, even like an Like 80. a masticator? Kind yes, of juicing? Yeah. Exactly. And the masticators yeah. opposed, opposed to, you know, you'll see if you go to your local juice bar or something. Now, we we were, when I lived in South Florida, we had one of the best in the country. They just closed after 13 years, but they were on the beach. Not only did they use a, uh, maybe nothing over 80 RPM, but they actually did most of it in a presser, your old mm. fashioned presser, uh, therefore not heating up the um, the greens, heating it up or you know destroying any enzymes. Yeah. So I probably know more about that than <laughs> remembering what ingredients I put in my, you know, my juices, but it was amazing how great I would feel. And then the only other place I knew down there, which also just went out, was a vegan restaurant that was open for uh, many, many, many years down there. But um, yeah, we had a Josh's Organic Market on the ocean, which was great. And you could sit out and have durian or coconuts or, and they do, of course, they would do fruit smoothies with their frozen organic fruit. Some of it was frozen. They would have a little bit of frozen fruit in there to make it colder because that's what the consumer wanted. But yeah, with the greens, that was pretty amazing that you would be using a slow RPM or like metastasizer yeah. or um, just them watching them press it with the machine uh, as in order to keep all those enzymes live and fresh as possible. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up too, because 
I know I, I've purchased certain brands like Breville Juicer and Jacqueline Juicer and stuff like that. And it, they seem to work well for like the first month. And then, yeah. and then they end up dying on me. Plus, they really don't produce their, their lower cost, which is nice. So lower barrier to entry than a masticating juicer. But they don't have a very long shelf life from my experience. And also, they don't produce as much juice as the masticator. Masticator takes longer. It's tougher to clean. But, uh, but you get a lot more of the, the nutrients out of it. And like you said, it's not really heating it. So, um, you know, they're fully intact. So oh, yeah. Yeah, I, think, no. I think it is a good idea to um, invest into the masticator if you really want to start juicing, doing it well. I how about intermittent fasting? Let's talk about intermittent fasting and, and how you apply it personally. Sure. So I'm better than, um, than I know I was going to say this, I'm not better. I, I'll say that Joe, uh, my significant other, Joe's better at fasting after, like not eating after dark or even mm -hmm. after three or four. And admittedly, I am not as uh, well-trained on that. I do better at fasting, at, at, at skipping breakfast, which he's talked about, although yeah. I think he'd prefer to see people and I would probably benefit from um, it, with the intermittent fasting from eating early on and then stopping and having my, you know, fast be maybe after three or four through that whole evening until the next day when I wake up like he does. But um, for me, I, I know that's difficult for people, especially if um, they are having dinner as a family. So that's one yeah. <laughs> you know, with children that, that want to eat. Um, so sometimes it can be easier to, um, I think, adopt a plan where somebody is not going to have breakfast. And I know that people have talked about you know, breakfast being the most important meal of the day. But as you know, now that people are rethinking that idea. So I do better than with like today, I haven't <laughs> eaten yet, which is a little crazy because it's just time and everything else. But um, I will after this. And so um, when I, I will wake up and I do my best to consume a good amount of water and uh, maybe take a couple different supplements, but that's still your you're still considered fasting, even if you need a few supplements that you will take in the morning. And, uh, but then I may not eat my meal till later in the day. I don't, I jokingly might say practice, um, you know, do what I say, not as I, I do as I say, not what I do, because um, I would probably not wait until this late in the day to eat because that can then get you into a later schedule. But some people, if they're up at six or seven, um, they may skip breakfast, but have their first meal be lunch. And sort of like the Europeans do, what I noticed going over and meeting my birth mother is they take two hours and everything closes in the, in the entire village or city, no matter where I've been in Europe. And they will take two plus hours to relax. It's so different than the American, uh, traditions and they will take that time over lunch to savor their food even shockingly have a little bit of wine but of course it's uh probably a lot healthier than they, they say i know people literally who i have been out with who do drink wine and they'll say oh i don't do california wines uh because of the maybe the pesticides or the sulfates or all that but they'll do the european wines only um but someone may even have a tiny bit of wine whether they're a drink or not i'm not really so i don't but um they may partake in a little bit of that, but just savor their meal, eat it slowly, and have their large meal be that noon lunchtime meal, which I think was originally how things were supposed to be in the States since so many people came over from European nations. And um, then the lighter meal is dinner, or some people will even have a little bit later lunch at you know, maybe have a small breakfast and then fast till two or three and then have their big meal then and then not eat again until the next day because they won't have a, you know, they won't have a dinner or they may have a light dinner. Um, but for me right now, just to be more practical, I do better at skipping my breakfast and sometimes even my lunch and then maybe eating one big meal of the day. And there are people who believe in that philosophy, as you probably know, of eating one large meal a day and saying that our ancestors wouldn't have years and years ago wouldn't have been able to have three square meals a day and so they have one big meal i know that's that's something i know some people do and it works for them but each person is different of course yeah absolutely i you know i love the siesta idea because ultimately like in our society fast food we, we hear about like fast food restaurants we should never be eating fast it's kind of um you know yeah. It's exactly that that sort of idea of fast food is terrible for our digestive system. We need to be in a relaxed state to activate our parasympathetic nervous system so we can secrete the right amount of stomach acid, digestive enzymes, and bile. So we want to be consuming that larger meal when we're in a, 
our most relaxed, stress-free period of time during the day, right? And so if it's, for most of us, it's actually in the evening, but if we want to do that in the middle of the day, we need to carve that out and take a siesta, right? Yeah. When we have that time, like you were talking about, just so, so important. And you're right. I mean, it's like, you can, you can find, you can create an eating window based on what's going to work best for you schedule wise, right? And then also, you know, socially and with your family and whatnot. So if you guys say, hey, you know what, we're going to do our two meals earlier in the day, great. You just build, you kind of customize your lifestyle around that. Or if you're going to do it in the evening or afternoon, evening, um, you can customize it around that. Now, I know there are a lot of people out there that say, hey, women should never fast. It doesn't work well with, with female hormones. Okay. And, and what, what has been your experience as far as that goes? Well, I am the first to admit through two hurricanes in 11 months and having to gut our home and rip out walls and ceilings twice in less than a year that mm. I have then succumbed somewhat to adrenal fatigue. I'm mm. always very open with my audience about like if I've gone a few steps backwards. So um, I think when I have adrenal fatigue, which I'm still overcoming, that I'm a little more careful and I don't do well as well if someone has really exhausted uh, adrenals to do or maybe thyroid challenges or maybe they're going through major hormonal changes um, that they some some women don't that is true men may be able to do it more easily and uh, with with the women they may do better with smaller meals throughout the day but still they could um, not eat at after dark and another thing you brought up and I, I want to go back to the women but with um, you said the dinner I know that people will joke and say, oh, come on, that's when the old people eat or whatever. But um, some folks will, because because you said when you're relaxed, sometimes after work. But traditionally growing up, we didn't eat till, you know, 7.30, sometimes 7.45. We did not eat dinner before 7.30 at night. That's just how I was raised. But you could make that meal like the... The old folks in Florida, and we love we love them. But the the elderly folks who may eat the you know, that early bird yeah. special at five or five thirty, they they there may be something to that. So that could be your dinner. So for women who are um, experiencing whether it be hormonal changes, thyroid, adrenal exhaustion, or all of the above. Um, I think that it may be more difficult for them to fast, especially a long-term juice or water fast, um, but they could still, even if they didn't feel comfortable with intermittent fasting, we're all intermittent fasting to some degree because as you know, after we, if we eat dinner and then we sleep, breakfast, bre breakfast is breaking your fast. So um, that the, the women could definitely, who maybe fit into that category, just eat an earlier dinner and it probably could, uh, I would, I mean, I'm not trying to, I, I would imagine it could help some people where they were to uh, eat that last meal of the day, maybe when the sun's going down, have that relaxing dinner, but do their best to not, uh, and this is, I'm, I'm doing my best to practice what I preach here, to eat that meal earlier earlier then um I, you can always yeah. and, and joe and i talk about i'll sip on a little bit of tea if afterwards i have that yeah. craving because you can't eat have a little tea or something even a little stevia in it probably will be fine organic of course and all that and i do organic raw stevia and i'm okay with stevia some people aren't but then do my best to go to bed early and that might help with the adrenal exhaustion or with the uh with the uh maybe uh, you know, thyroid really isn't my issue, but, or, uh, you know, with, uh, just hormonal changes because I'm at that age where I think the yeah. hormones are changing. So, um, yeah, I, but, and, and then other women are able to do like a five day water fast, no problem. But for me in my, maybe in my twenties and even my thirties, I could do that more easily, but yeah, I don't do as many five day water fasts. And right yeah. now I probably wouldn't do that until I felt that I built myself up a little bit more from these hurricanes, which just, I think the anniversary was yesterday of our last big one. So yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so, and you're also very, very lean as well. So it can be a yeah. little bit more challenging for, for women that are very, very lean. And so, you know, basically, you know, fasting is a mild stressor on the body. So if your body's already overwhelmed, it can't adapt to stress. We don't want to add in more stress. But what I found is that most people can, and we, I call it the simple fast. And so it's, it's 12 hours between your last meal and your first meal. So like if you finish dinner, which like in my family, we try to be done at dinner by six o'clock. So if right. we finish dinner, six o'clock, I mean, it's like typically not going to be really waking up before six anyways the next day. And so, um, so, and then you start your day. I tell people, do your best to get 16 ounces of good, clean, filtered water into your system before you even think about food. 
Yes. And if you do that, it actually suppresses hunger. And you typically can start to go longer and you feel energized in the morning. And you can start to push that fast out to maybe 13, 14, 15 hours before you really even feel hungry. And if you're good at hydrating, if you kind of develop a skill, because most people are chronically dehydrated, they're, they're oh. not good at hydrating. As you start to develop the hydration skill of kind of saturating your body with water, especially earlier in the day, um, it just kind of continues to push off the hunger and you start to be able to expand that fasting window. And, uh, you know, if you can get it to where you're, you're fasting for, for 14, 16, even 18 hours, you know, every day, you're going to get tremendous health benefits. Um, and the hydration will really help. So I don't know okay. if you've, you've experienced that. Oh, yeah. And I think during, uh, especially during the times where we had to move out for, you know, nine months of the, out of the house and then back in and then out again because of another storm. So I think that I became chronically dehydrated. And that can yeah. take a while to recover from that I've, uh, that I've noticed. So, um, with, uh, and with overcoming Lyme and all these other things, I find that so much there's, you know, the books out there, your body's many cry for water, cries for water. Yeah. And all that. I think that it's so important. Yes. In fact, I noticed when I were trying to fix some internet issues that I'm like, wow, now I don't even have a water, but afterwards I will make up for that. And I think something that's so important that you say that. And in the morning, I would imagine that you could then just drink that water now, probably if somebody wants to get that water in them, they could drink it rather quickly. But what I had been taught over the years too was also, and this is the hardest part for me, is, but it's kind of like life in general, to sip that water throughout the day when we're drinking our water and that we absorb it more readily, at least what I am told by these experts I've, that I've talked with. And so um, I tend to, oh my gosh, I didn't drink water for two hours and I guzzle down two big glasses of water. Well, and then, you know, a few minutes, uh, maybe 15, 20 minutes later, you have to go, you have to go to the restroom. So um, sipping it slowly throughout the day, kind of like uh, the idea of life of just doing everything, uh, you know, kind of not, not just uh, rushing and then, oh my gosh, and then suddenly you have to have that water. Um, but I find that is so much more helpful, um, even if you just kind of carry it around for you or measure it, little simple things that aren't expensive or cost any money at all. Um, but that makes a big difference. And when I notice when I really make sure I have my water intake and that I drink it kind of s slowly throughout the day and don't just forget and drink two giant glasses uh, after I haven't for several hours, it does make a difference. So yeah, that, at least for yeah. me. Yeah, I know, I'm totally with you. In fact, I think there's benefits to both. I think <clears throat> drinking a lot all at once, like especially in the morning, really good for flushing the bowels, yeah. right? So yeah. getting things moving, all your drainage pathways, your lymphatics, kidneys, uh, bowels, just getting those drainage pathways opened up a lot, just drinking a lot of water. Obviously, you don't want to throw up, you don't want to get nauseous, but right. drinking as much water up until that point can really help open all those up. But it's, you're right, it's not going to be the best strategy for optimal daily hydration and optimal daily energy. And that's where you need kind of more of the, the slow, uh, continuous, I always say, hey, two to four ounces every 15 to 30 minutes. Yeah. And so two ounces is typically like, you know, I just took a drink. It's like a mouthful, right? So if you were to take a mouthful every 15 minutes, or if for some reason you're not able to do it in 15 minutes, you do two mouthfuls in a 30 minute period of time, you're going to see that your energy, your stamina, your endurance, mental clarity stays high. And again, it will help protect against unnecessary hunger. You know, a lot of times in our society, we're, we're, we're having cravings, we're hungry, but we're really thirsty. Yeah. And, um, and so it can help protect against us. You really only eat when you, when you truly do need to eat. So, right. Right. Yes. There's so yeah. much I think is a habit and, and I've noticed, uh, oh, and I think another thing for me is not having, uh, for, for, well, it's always difficult depending on, how, on the size of the family or the ages of the family, but to not have the foods, um, that I, that I crave or really don't need, or probably shouldn't be having just not have them in the house. That can be oh, yeah. So, but, you know, depending on your family size, because somebody else might want that food. But yeah, it does take discipline, no doubt. And I agree with you 100% about in the morning about getting that water going, get, like you said, getting everything moving. So um, yep. yeah, I agree. My toughest thing is probably doing just as you said and recommend drinking those ounces just like every 15 20 minutes. So that I'm seeking to be better at that. And we're so, I guess we're lucky because I don't know what happened when I, what I don't, I'm 
what the heck happened when I was a kid? What did anyone do? Because you still ran around and ran errands, but um, how we didn't have, no one had water bottles. Now everybody's got yeah. their you know, transportable water bottle if they bring to the gym or, but I'm not sure how everyone was, uh, I mean, they say people were healthier back maybe like in the eighties the or seventies, but they didn't have water bottles, but I guess maybe they all, another thing too, is that, that helped me with a weight loss because I did go from a, a what, a four, 39 inch waist to a 26 inch waist, which I'm still at five years later. Um, was to, now I have to remember what I was going to say, um, was, uh, well, well, food combining, but there was something else in there, gosh, and as, as I thought about those measurements, I just forgot, but um, we're talking about, oh, drinking, we're talking about drinking water, food combination, and um, yeah, now I know the secret, and I've forgotten it, <laughs> yeah, what was the secret to, to losing the weight, um, but not having the foods, but also, yeah, I mean, dr drinking the water was a big part of it, it'll come to me in a second, but, um, but yeah, I think that uh, for me, um, it was the, it was simple food combining, and remembering to carry that water around with me, because just like you said, so often, we aren't really hungry, we're thirsty. And that's what I realized probably in my weight loss journey as well. So. Yeah, I think that's a powerful, I mean, ultimately, our health walk is really about mastering our own physiology. I tell my clients all the time, the path to getting well and staying well is kind of like getting a master's degree in your own health. It's, it's really okay. a self study. And it, it doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen in, you know, a month It happens over the course of your life. And typically, I mean, if you were to go and get an advanced degree, it's going to take you six months, a year, two years, you know, sometimes longer to get yeah. that degree, and you're going to spend a lot of time, money and energy in order to do that. But at the end of the day, you have something you can carry with you for the rest of your life. When it comes to your health, you have a level of mastery of your physiology and the, the unique biorhythms that you have and how to attune those so you can experience incredible health and energy and mental clarity. And you can bring that with you for the rest of your life. And so um, opening ourselves to good hydration strategies, to food combining, like you were talking about, um, you know, understanding when we really do need to eat versus when we're just kind of like emotionally craving something because we want to hit a dopamine to make us feel good, right? I think those those are kind of the biorhythms that we want to be able to understand and master. And so, Eric, this has been a great conversation. What, what sort of final words of inspiration do you have for our listeners here? Sure, Doc. I would say that I just, as I know you see the talk or run into these people or they write you every day and they write me every day that are struggling so much with their own health or maybe a family member is, um, that I always want people to remember that not only can you take a step back, but that doesn't mean you can't go back and take a step forward, but to keep the faith and to know that there's always light at the end of that tunnel. Mm. I think for some people, whether they, and now I can understand so much more having had multiple fractures and injury and an accident that whether it's um, whether you're in have pain or whether you're struggling with uh, weight usually with the weight gain and the weight that you want to lose or chronic fatigue or um, an autoimmune disorder whatever it might be that you have faith and that you know that there is light at the end of that tunnel that you can get through it and sometimes just slowing down and it, it, which you might want to feel like you want to rush 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 and fix everything but slowing down and really figuring out what you're going to do and know that um know that you will make it through and uh as difficult as it might seem sometimes that has been really kind of life-saving for me a few times absolutely great mindset to have and I just want to uh, just acknowledge you, Aaron, for all the great work that you do over at HealthNet News and just being a pioneer as far as getting this health freedom message out and reporting so well on it. And so where, where can people find out more about you? I know I had mentioned HealthNet News um, and what, what kinds of things are you working on? Sure. So on HealthNet News, I do have a book that I still give away. We're just updating it. And even if someone downloads it, you can, there's no they can they can go there put their email in and, and download the book if they want which talk about the weight loss journey and probably a few things that I <laughs> forgotten in the interview but um, they can find me there and I do a number of I, I work on a lot of things so I'd say the thing that's right now that I'm working on the very most are the um, the issues we have with um, and I think I hear the thunder as I speak you may you may catch it on tape but we've had some pretty um, 
I don't even know how to describe it, devastating um, things happen here with Florida, uh, with the big sugar industry, which we all know we're doing our best not to support big sugar and buy processed sugar products. At least I, I am. I, I understand people need to indulge once in a while, but they're releasing that water into Lake Okeechobee. I'm sorry, the water is in Lake Okeechobee and then they're releasing it from Lake Okeechobee because they've changed where the water is being diverted into the Treasure Coast, which is just south of here. We're on the East Coast or on this in Southwest um, Florida. So it's not the most um, a positive uplifting story, but yet we, we need to do something about that because the, the, this is not just the state of Florida, but all the Gulf states. And I think it'll affect all the states from Georgia up the East Coast we're all connected and the water goes all around. So um, whether you're talking about the Gulf or the Atlantic, um, I'm working because we've had thousands of, you know, marine life, sea life, endangered sea turtles and dolphins and all that sad stuff washed up on the shore here in recent months on a, um, a, re a, vi a viable solution to the, um, the pollution of, from the big agriculture and the big sugar companies and holding those companies responsible since politicians on both sides have uh, pretty much taken some of them millions or hundreds of thousands of dollars from those companies and getting them, the, the politicians, if that's possible, you know, how hard that can be, to um, hold the, these corporations responsible so they don't continue to devastate our waterways and, and put children, uh, animals, people's pets in the hospital, and of course the marine life and, and adults as well. Well, thanks so much for being on the front line and doing that work. Um, you know, we, we've got to get the word out. We've got to spread the word. And so you're right. We can't, we can't continue to support companies like this that, um, you know, are destroying our planet and so, and mm -hmm. as well as our health. So thank you again for doing that. And uh, for all the listeners out there, I just want to remind you that fasting has the ability to unlock the dormant healing potential within you. It is safe, it's powerful, and it just might transform your life. So try it out. And we'll see you on a future interview. Be blessed. Bye-bye.